So let's take a look at presidential elections. Uh, this will take us basically from the beginning of the process uh, up through the actual election itself, and we'll deal with the Electoral College in a different section. So there are certain stages to winning the presidency. Uh, and I've listed here uh, the stages for the most recent presidential election campaign. So the first uh, stage would be what we call laying the groundwork. And basically that took place from the end of the election in 2012 when President Barack Obama was reelected until the end of the midterm elections in 2014. Uh, it's particularly interesting in the 2016 race because uh, there was no incumbent no incumbent president, so it was a free-for-all on both the Democratic and Republican sides. Everybody's jockeying for position at that point. We call the invisible primary basically what goes on in the year prior to the actual election taking place. So in 2015, people were jockeying for position, jockeying to raise money, to raise their profiles, and they're trying to do that before we actually have any votes. Then the primaries come, and they start in January or February <coughs> and run generally into the early spring, depending on how competitive the races are. And these are where the candidates winter themselves down, and they try to become the nominee of the Republican or Democratic Party. Then you have, after that, you have a kind of a decision. Before there's actually a convention, we see that there's kind of a national campaign. We already know who the nominees are going to be. And what happens during that period is you try to build your national profile, and before the convention, there's a national campaign. Conventions in recent decades uh, have been held later on in the summer. Uh, this time around, in 2016, they actually held uh, their uh, conventions in July and August. Uh, and then you have the general election campaign, which runs generally from what we consider to be Labor Day through November 8th, which was the day of the election in 2016. All right, so what do you do when you lay the groundwork? <clears throat> so prior to the midterm elections, which would have occurred in 2014, basically your goal is to go around the country and build up support and name recognition. Uh, so you contribute money uh, to people that are running uh, for Congress around the country, for people running for state legislatures around the country in key states. And why do you bother to do that? This kind of leadership pack raises money for you to hand out to other politicians around the country. What I want to do is start to build support for my presidential candidacy in the early key states. Right? And in presidential elections, there are two key early states. Iowa, which has the Iowa caucuses, which are the first to go, and then the New Hampshire primary after that. I want to spend as much time as I can in Iowa and New Hampshire as possible. I want to meet people there. Uh, and go to some of the other early primary states, which include South Carolina and Nevada. Uh, I go around the state party conventions, uh, talk to people there, give speeches, typically oftentimes write a book so that I can sell and give out my message. And then I want to start to build kind of a decent campaign staff so people know that I'm serious. During the period of the invisible primary, which takes place in the year before the actual election, uh, people start generally what's called a presidential exploratory committee, which does polling and tests different messages see whether or not people think I can actually be a legitimate candidate. And some people have these presidential exploratory committees and then decide there's no use in me running, there's no way I can win. Other people say, yeah, I think I got a chance now. And then you have a formal announce announcement. Usually, recent years, it's been late spring, early summer, uh, the year before the election. And then you start to raise money. And it's kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy. The more money that you raise, the more legitimate that you're considered to be. The more legitimate of a candidate that you're considered to be, the more money you raise. So people get caught in a vicious cycle. If they can't raise any money, nobody thinks that they're a viable candidate. And if they're not a viable candidate, then nobody's going to want to give them money. Uh, so this is a, a very interesting period where candidates winter themselves out. Um, you know, in this, this election cycle, um, by fall of 2015, Hillary Clinton really became what we considered at the time to be the prohibitive favorite for the Democrats. She really, her, her strength of, as a candidate kind of kept most strong other candidates out of the race, uh, including Joe Biden. Uh, Vice President Biden made a decision not to run in early fall. Uh, his son had passed away earlier in the year, and he didn't think it was right for his family to, for him to run. So it looked like Hillary was, was going to do pretty well. Republicans had no clear leader. 
going into the fall. And there were actually, you know, um, a little bit less than 20 candidates sort of run, which made it a, pretty much a free for all. <clears throat> now, you can see right here uh, the candidates that eventually ran uh, in the primary system. We ended up with Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. Uh, and what you see is uh, Trump made 17 candidates that ran for the Republicans uh, and for the Democrats, six candidates. There were really only two legitimate candidates for the Democrats, and that was Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders, uh, who did go down to the wire. Now, what's interesting, if you take a look underneath the Republicans here for the, for, uh, the GOP, for the Republican Party, what's very interesting is that... Uh, Texas Governor Rick Perry, um, Wisconsin Governor Scott Walker, uh, Louisiana Governor Bobby Jindal, uh, Senator Lindsey Graham, and former Governor George Pataki of New York all dropped out before the voting even occurred. Right. Perry actually and Walker dropped out in like you know September and, and I think July of 2015. So they started to run and they're like, nah, it's just not gonna happen. And then most of the other candidates dropped out after the Iowa caucuses and also New Hampshire. So what do I want to do if I want to win? I want to really spend a lot of time on the early states uh, and spend a lot of time visiting Iowa and New Hampshire. Um, if you can finish in the top three in both of those states or pull some kind of surprise in those states, that gives you a lot of momentum going into the rest of the primary elections for the, for the season. So as you can see here, uh, in New Hampshire, which is the first primary state, uh, Hillary Clinton had 174 events, Bernie Sanders had 214, Donald Trump 85, Ted Cruz 202, and Marco Rubio 150. Sorry. Uh, what you have to do here is build what we call uh, a hands-on retail politics organization, have a lot of people in the street. Each one of those events, you collect names, uh, you continue to contact those people and try to get them out to vote for your candidate when it comes time for the primary. Now, if you take a look at this picture here, it's a picture of Marco Rubio. What we mean by retail politics is, um, you know, most of us has never met a presidential candidate. If you live in Iowa or New Hampshire, you'll actually meet people multiple times um, because there are such small states uh, and yet people spend so much time there uh, that you can meet the presidential candidates one-on-one. -on -one. So the beauty of Iowa and New Hampshire is that it's almost like running for state legislature. There were so few people in those two states and so many candidates running and spending so much time there that scenes like you see right here with Marco Rubio meeting with people in a diner uh, are, are what happens every day across those two states. Uh, again, I'm going to build an organization there. I'm going to get people out, registering people to vote, get people's names, and contact those people and try to get them to the polling place. And that's the way that I win those elections. Now, there are a whole different type of presidential primary elections. Right? And I just want to name a couple of here. So there is what's called the closed primary. And this is what we have in Pennsylvania. So essentially in a closed primary, you have to be a Democrat or a Republican in order to be able to vote in the political primary. So if you're registered as a Democrat, the only primary that you can vote in is the Democratic primary. If you're registered as a Republican, the only primary that you can vote in is the Republican primary. What about independents? Well, they're out of luck. If you're a registered independent, you can't vote in either one of the presidential primaries. Now, the idea behind a closed primary is that it makes sense that people who are Republicans should be the people that are choosing the Republican candidate. It makes sense that people that are the Democratic candidate should be the person choosing the Democratic candidates. And that's the idea behind a closed primary. Now, that's not the way it is in every state. So in some states, they have what's called an open primary. And that allows me, essentially, to be able to vote in either of the primaries, depending on what I feel like doing at that point in time. So maybe I'm a Democrat, but I'm really much more interested in the Republican race. I can show up and I can vote in the Republican primary even though I'm registered as a Democrat. That's fine. The Republicans can do the same thing. And here, unlike the closed primary, in the open primary, people that are registered independents are able to actually vote in the primary election. Again, because you can decide which primary you want to vote uh, in, in that individual day. 
And not to get too deep in the weeds here, but there's also something called a modified open primary. And essentially what this does is, if you're an independent, you can choose which political primary you want to vote in. So if I'm an independent, I can choose to vote in the Republican or the Democratic primary on the day of the election. However, if I'm a Republican, I have to vote in the Republican election. And if I'm a Democrat, I have to vote in the Democratic election. Right? Independents get to choose. If you're registered for a party, you have to vote in that party's primary. Now, the last thing, uh, the last kind of type of election that we see here is something called uh, a caucus, right? And the most notable caucus is the Iowa caucus. Uh, and what I've done here is I've got a little video here uh, that will show us what the Iowa caucuses are all about. Uh, and there's uh, no actual kind of, uh, there's no sound behind this. Uh, it's all written out. So take a look at this. After the advertisement. Get ready for this. So what you see from that is essentially that uh, when you take a look at the Iowa caucuses, uh, general elections, the big showdown between the Democratic nominee and the Republican, attract way more interest than the primary campaigns that determine the nominees. Aha! Sorry about that. So. The caucuses, in many respects, are very similar to what you might see in a high school election, uh, in which people do uh, kind of hand-to-hand -hand combat to determine and help to influence people and help them to vote certain ways. In the other systems of primaries, essentially no one sees how you vote because you vote in private. With the caucuses, you're publicly declaring who you're going to support. Uh, then the final way mixes all of these. So in the state of Texas, they have a mixed primary and caucus, which is Probably, as far as I know, the only way that you can legally vote twice in one day in the United States, uh, and that is during the day they have a primary election, uh, and about two thirds of all the uh, all the uh, delegates to the convention are chosen there, and then at night they have a caucus. Now, the big thing about these caucuses, as that video explained to you, is they're very time consuming. So you can show up to vote, vote in 10, 15 minutes, and leave. With a caucus, you got to be there, you have to register, you can be waiting outside, particularly in Iowa and New Hampshire, it can be very cold this time of year, uh, and it can take several hours. Uh, so, you know, low turnout in the caucuses, but the people that do show up are very politically active. Um, 
Here's a, a kind of a, a, a map of the, the presidential primaries and caucuses in 2016 by month. Uh, there's a lot of front loading uh, to this, so there's a lot of uh, uh, primaries in February and March. Um, you know, and as we dragged into April, it became more apparent who the, uh, who the candidates were going to be for each political party. Now, there's one thing, I ripped this off from your textbook, there's one thing I want to pull out here and talk a bit about what happens during primary elections. And this, this happens not just for presidential candidates, but also for members of uh, Congress. And that is that uh, if you take a look at the bottom part here, People that vote in Republican primaries tend to be more conservative than the average Republican and much more conservative than the average American, right? So in a Republican primary election, Republican candidates have to act more conservative. They have to hold very conservative positions if they are going to be able to win. The same is true for the Democratic Party as well. So Democrats who vote in Democratic primary elections tend to be much more liberal than the average Democrat and much more liberal than the average American. So if I want to win the Democratic primary in almost any type of election, I have to appeal, appeal to those people that are the most liberal within my party. Right? Now, the problem is that, that that works in the primary elections. But if I'm a Republican, it makes me be pulled to the right, be pulled to be more of a conservative. If I'm a Democrat, it pulls me towards the left to make me more liberal. And then, during the general election campaign, I have to moderate towards the center. Uh, so if you see on the top here, you see what happens. The bell curve shifts. And now I'm trying to attract all those people that are moderates. But the problem is, I've said all these things during the primary elections that make me seem more conservative than I might be if I'm a Republican, or more liberal than I might be if I'm a Democrat. Um, so the primary process pulls people to extremes, sometimes they can get back to the middle. Sometimes it's very difficult for them to do so. Presidential conventions. Uh, in years past, these were very important. Uh, you go into the convention, you wouldn't exactly know who was going to come out as the nominee. Uh, there were hung conventions, there would be multiple votes. Uh, in the United States, since 1968, we really haven't had any contested conventions. Um, you know, because we have the political primary process and we know who's going to be the nominee prior uh, to actually holding the conventions. So, you know, why do we have these? Uh, you know, really no drama. Everything takes place out of sight that would be dramatic. For the most part, all the kind of uh, cleavages or all the kind of disagreements among the party are ironed out prior to the convention. Uh, there'll be a platform for the political party uh, that lays out their goals and their agendas for the next four years. That's voted on. On occasion, there might be a little bit of conflict about that, but very little. Um, then you approve the, pres the vice presidential nominee, uh, and then you approve the presidential nomination. Now, what's interesting about all that is that apparent, you know, at this point, basically all this is is really an introduction for the president and the vice president. Uh, to the American public, particularly if they don't currently hold office. Uh, so the vice presidential candidate goes on national TV, and then the last night of the convention, you have the presidential candidate running, and then he gives a great speech, and then next thing you know, there are balloons falling from the sky, and people are waving, and all this kind of stuff in this media spectacle. The conventions really hold no other practical purpose at this point in time other than exposing the candidates to the public, giving the public a chance to be able to view the candidates and the people that are associated with the, the, the two political parties. So you get an idea or a taste of what the Republican Party stands for in 2016 or what the Democratic Party stands for in 2016 as well. But really there is no practical, real reason for party conventions uh, since we've had the political primary process.